Today's first chapter Friday is called Too Bright to See. And um, it is one of our newest books. Um, I do have two copies of this book. It was one that um, was, was, we were able to get in our, in our uh, library because of our Blue Bonnet Committee. Um, and it's a little bit of one of those scary books, but also one of um, kind of finding yourself. Bug experiences firsthand a summer of loss. Um, she loses her uncle, um, some changes, ghosts, and, and ultimately she has some connection with some of her friends and family. So she's an 11 year old uh, bug. It says in the first part of the, the book, the inside cover, 11 year old bug is used to haunted things. After all, the occasional cold spot or mysteriously slamming door is to be expected when your house is almost as old as the dirt it sits on. But when a new presence makes itself known the summer before Bug starts middle school, it's clear that this spirit is intent on communicating something directly to Bug. But what and why? Um, this was written by a uh, former librarian. His name is Kaya Lukoff, and he dedicates the book um, too bright to see for all the students who came through my library at Corlear School 2012 to 2020. This book is because of you. Prologue. It's strange living in our old house now that Uncle Roderick is dead. I already know my house is haunted. It's always been haunted. That hasn't changed. We avoid the freezing cold spot in the corner of the living room because someone probably died there. Windows slam themselves open or shut on the stillest days. So do doors, and these doors are heavy. For a long time, I thought it was normal to sense someone standing behind you or next to you and not be able to see them, for invisible hands to brush past your hair, your clothes. And it looks haunted, wooden, unpainted, weathered with time. There's an elaborately carved front door, peaked roofs jutting out in all directions, tall windows with shapes flickering behind them. The porch wraps around front to back with rocking chairs that sometimes rock on their own. We're out in the middle of nowhere and at nighttime there's moonlight and starlight and nothing else. When I was in kindergarten, I checked a book out of the library because the house on the front cover looked like a photograph of my home. Uncle Roderick tried reading it to me that, at, that night, my head resting on his chest, his arm tucked beneath my shoulders. We always read together before bed. He had to stop after the first chapter because it was a collection of scary stories. He believed that dreams were important and he didn't want to give me bad ones. But now this old house seems haunted in a different way, a way that's both more boring and more frightening. There's a half empty jar of okra Uncle Roderick picked, picked and pickled that he'll never finish eating. And mom and I both hate okra. His winter boots are jammed in the closet. He always put off wearing them for as long as possible, saying they made him look like a lumberjack, but now he'll never need them again. He subscribed to magazines, The New Yorker, National Geographic, and they'll keep being addressed to him until we tell them to stop, until they take his name off the list forever. I prefer the ghosts. Chapter one. The moment he dies, I know. It's the middle of the night. My eyes open and I grip the mattress with both hands. I'm suddenly, irrationally convinced that my bed is toppling over, like it's unbalanced, perched precariously on the top of a mountain and about to come crashing down, or like it's teetering on the edge of a black hole with nothing familiar on the other side. Uncle Roderick's room is at the top of the stairs. Mom's is at the end of the hall. For 11 years, I've fallen asleep, snug in the middle, their warmth and weight keeping me grounded from both sides. Even these past couple months when he's been in the hospital and then hospice, I could still feel him there, keeping me safe at the top of the stairs. But now I know my uncle is gone. The stairs creak, sharp and loud. That doesn't mean anything. They creak all the time. The house is settling is what mom says. And sometimes it might be a harmless ghost. But now I hear the groan of a foot on a step and then another. It's like the sound of someone slowly moving up our wide staircase someone with a heavy tread. It's mid-June and hot and I'm lying under me under a sheet with a fan blowing warm air around the room. I pull the sheet up to my chin wishing for the weight of a comforter to press me into the mattress, something to hide under. The creaks stop at the top right in front of Uncle Roderick's bedroom door. I hold my breath and strain my ears. I can't hear anything but it doesn't sound like no one's there. It sounds like someone being silent. 
I only exhale when the creaks descend the stairs as slowly as they came. Uncle Roderick always told me that passing spirits and lingering presences are a normal part of living in a house almost as old as the dirt it sits on. Mom says that the creepy things I sense or feel or hear are just part of an active imagination and that Uncle Roderick shouldn't encourage it, that ghosts aren't real. I only occasionally believe my mom when the sun is bright and I can explain away strange hands tucking, touching my neck or a mysteriously slammed shut door as stray gusts of wind in a drafty old building. I believe my uncle now, surely and suddenly, but I don't want to. There's no one on the stairs, I tell myself, wanting it to be true, still holding onto the mattress for dear life. There's no one on the stairs. There's no one on the stairs. There's no one on the stairs. The rhythm pounds through my brain, repeating itself over and over, crowding out every other thought that also must be true. I manage to fall asleep by curling up into a ball, my back turned toward the half of the room that echoes the now emptiness, the new emptiness in my chest. I wake up again a few hours later because the phone rings. I feel grounded now, not in a free fall, not hurtling through space, but there's an empty room inside my chest. Mom's voice struggles through the wall. None of the words are clear, but I, don't, I didn't know about Uncle Roderick. All, but if I didn't know about Uncle Roderick already, I would know now from her tone, the rise and fall of sentences. She comes into my bedroom a few minutes later and I sit up. She holds me and cries. I've seen my mother cry before, but it's never been my job to comfort her. It's always been Uncle Roderick's job, but her brother's not here and I am. I hold her tight and breathe as shallowly as possible until her sobs subside. I should have cried that first day almost a year ago when Uncle Roderick came home from the doctor with bad news, but I couldn't. I remember a rushing sound filling my ears Drowning out the details, my brain refusing to take in anything beyond one main truth, something too big to touch with no details to snag on. I told myself I'd only cry once he was gone, but that day has come and I've got nothing, no tears and no anything else. There's sadness, but it's whirling around outside of me like a hurricane of grief and I'm the dry, unmoving I. He loved you very much, you know, mom says, after a bit, she lets go, sits up straight, palms the tears off her cheeks. I wish I had a tissue to offer her. I know he did, I say, and I do, but it doesn't help. Mom hugs me once more, then says she has to make some phone calls. I stare across my room, sunlight streaming through the tall window with rippled glass and wonder what happens after this. Too Bright to See by Kyle Lukoff.